Hello, welcome back to Urban X Files. My name is Keith, and today is another spooky story. And today's story takes us all the way to Croxteth Park. And in fact, in Croxteth Park, there is a beautiful house. And the name Croxteth is thought to be a contraction of Crocker's Stave, translating as a landing place of Crocker. I have no idea what this means, but this dates back from around 800 um, BC, when a Norseman by the name of Crocker sailed into the area by the River Alt and claimed the land his own. Now, Croxteth Park Estate is a very large residential suburb adjacent to Croxteth itself. And it takes its title from the um, 0.77 square miles of parkland surrounding the historic Croxteth Hall. This is the former home of the Molyneux family, the Earls of Sefton, and the Molyneux were once governors of Liverpool Castle. Um, and their association with the city is traced back all the way to the 1200s and the family are by no means the oldest recorded residents of the area however in 1992 it was discovered that the site dating back from the Gothic period between 6,000 and 7,000 years ago on farmland in Croxteth Park was to be destroyed by the council to make way for a housing development and during a rushed archaeological examination of the area more than 500 flint tools had been found which coupled together with other evidence suggested that the encampment was a temporary post by hunters as they travelled through the dense woodland which once covered the area. The prehistoric camp now tragically lies buried beneath the 20th century housing estate, originally built in 1575, and it has been added to over the centuries. And Croxteth Hall, as it stands today, is an 18th century style house. It has vast lands that surround the hall that were once used for riding, hunting and farming. However, over the time the Earl's fortunes had dwindled and they were forced to sell off a lot of their estate. The last Lord of the Manor died in 1972, leaving no heirs. And in 1974 the hall and its land passed into the hands of Merseyside Council. Today, the park contains a traditional Victorian farmyard, wildflower meadow, a nature reserve, and a Victorian walled garden, as well as the house itself, which is open to the public. And for those of you that have not been to see Croxteth Hall, I strongly recommend you do so, because it's, it's amazing. Now, Croxteth Hall has had a reputation as being extremely haunted. Half of Liverpool seems sure that the historic building is filled with ghosts. This account was um, shared by John Ripian, um, who I've mentioned previous times in, in multiple uh, videos. And this is taken out of his 800 years of haunted Liverpool, which I suggest if you've not bought it, you go and buy it because it's phenomenal. And he said that he, an early obstacle he came up against in researching this piece was the spectre of Philip Flynn, who was a ghost hunter. Now, several online sources state that Croxteth Hall was actually built by Mr. Flynn, a supposed 16th century paranormal investigator. Now, this is news to me. I've never heard this before. So, he was very intrigued by the idea, but as it would seem, the work is of fiction. Flynn is not mentioned in any of the official literature that's been found uh, pertaining to the hall or the estate. Neither is he listed in the Oxford Dictionary National Biography or any other such publication. But this does not mean to say that it's not true, as people have had many aliases over the years before records are as stringent as they are today. 
So, when he asked the event manager at Croxteth Hall about Mr. Flynn, the event manager responded, Philip Thin, sorry, I have to ask the staff as nobody has ever heard of that name. Now, with that ghost moved aside, the um, he was fortunate enough to come into contact with a lady and a person who had previously done a lot of research in the hall's hauntings. She said during the mid 2000s, while studying for a Master of Philosophy degree at Liverpool University, this lady became a member of Merseyside Anomalies Research Association under the coordination of Mr. Eccles. Now, she joined the project as an extension of her research into the paranormal experiences, a field which she is now concentrating upon in her PhD at the University of Manchester. Now, in around 2004, as part of her work, she said she spent a day interviewing multiple members um, who, who worked in Croxteth Hall, and she noted down all of their own experiences. Pardon me. Now, the consultations were strictly confidential, so those who told the stories did so on the understanding that no names would be revealed to the general public. Now, the data that was collected was then organised into a tour of the hall on which she would act as the guide. Now, the gentleman who was the estate manager was kind enough to send him a document which this lady had prepared to help in memory as she directed visitors around the building. Now, with the lady's permission, what follows is John's own interpretation of that data. So, John has said, please purchase the ticket at the gift shop counter and turn toward the door, which leads to the mansion. And let us begin the tour of Croxteth Hall. Now, what I will do is, as I've done with Sudley House, I will go and give you a tour. Now, I'll have to try and get an appointment to do this because a lot of places don't like filming, especially if there's children around. So I will do this if I am able to, and it would be good if I could get in to investigate the place as well. So, this is the start of the tour. At the top of the main stairs, beneath the unseen gaze of the Victorian portraiture, witnesses have reported seeing the figure of a young boy. The child is dressed in Victorian rags, his face a mask of perfect misery. A similar apparition has been described appearing in the nearby dining room. The rest of the spirit of this urchin does seem slightly out of place in such a grand house, but without any historical evidence as to who he might be, it seemed futile to speculate. Staff also told the lady that disembodied voices are often heard in the area, and that a cool, eerie atmosphere seems to pervade the space. Now, an unassuming door to the right, just outside the dining room, leads to an old housekeeping corridor. Staff used this as their own hidden routes around the building so he would not disturb the owners of the house or his family or even their guests with the presence of the servants. An electrician bought, was brought in to do some work in the corridor a few years ago. He reportedly left early and never finished his job and when he was asked why, the workman confessed that he had seen something. He said, a person maybe in the passageway and he would de he declined to elaborate any further but he was so upset by the encounter he refused to return going back in time to the 1990s a security guard who was stationed at the old mesh room on the ground floor heard childlike footsteps running around at the top of the red staircase Having ascertained that it could not be any one of his colleagues playing a joke on him, the man climbed the stairs to investigate. As he reached the top, the sound suddenly stopped. Yet, as soon as he began to descend the stairs, these tiny footprints of pitter-patter feet resumed. The guard reported 
sorry, the guard repeated his journey up and down the stairs several times, and each time the sound stopped when he got close. And then when he reached, turned to go down again, they come back as strong as ever. There was no sign of any person around the stairs or the corridor for a figure to, to be that fast. And he said, a figure in white is also said to have been glimpsed in this area, flitting quickly into one of the rooms of the corridor. In Lady Sefton's sitting room, some 10 or 12 years ago, so now you're probably talking around 20, 25 years ago, a member of the staff glimpsed a curious reflection in a large mirror which hangs above a fireplace. He saw a woman standing in the corridor of the room behind him. This is his words. He said that she was wearing a cowl, a longish jacket which was square with embroidery around the edges. That was all in grey. He can remember thinking that the reflection was solid, not spooky and see-through, but he can't remember her having any face. A similar faceless grey figure has reportedly been seen on the corridor to the left of the main staircase. Downstairs in the servants' hall, there was an occasion when a member of staff suddenly caught the strong and distinct aroma of pipe smoke. The hall being a non-smoking area, this caused the worker some alarm. But he was baffled to learn that his coll colleagues who stood behind, beside him was unable to smell anything. This event, like many other minor yet odd occurrences, is said to have taken place on the anniversary of the birth of the first Earl. Croxteth Victorian kitchens, like much of the building, are dressed to give the appearance of a busy working environment, and back in the day they was. Up until the death of the last Earl in 1972, it was here that the chef, and one-time fugitive as a Nazi occupied France. His name is Raymond Lemprera. Now, I'd just like to pause for a minute because I actually personally met this chef years ago. He is one of the only people who actually lived inside Croxteth Hall with um, Lord and Lady Sefton. Um, and they... Um, he said that when Lady Sefton died, she said that he, um, he was still allowed to live on the grounds and he was given a cottage which is like near the, um, near the horse uh, stable place because I picked him up um, one afternoon and took him to the Royal Liverpool Hospital and he was telling me many stories. Um, of everything he experienced. So himself, his wife, and his son lived inside Croxteth Hall. He said that his son was his only child and that Lady Sefton was very fond of him because she had no children of her own. So she treated him like her own son. Um, anyway, back to the story. Raymond worked his culinary magic. Mr. Lemprera, Rua, however you pronounce it, is in his 70s, so now I must say he must be in his 80s, even 90s. Um, and he still lives on the grounds of the hall with his wife. His extraordinary life has already been the subject of a novel entitled Avingen to Liverpool, as well as the 2008 Croxteth Hall and French Connection. Now, back in 2004, staff reported an odd sensation of being watched in the kitchen area. One worker was standing on a chair to change a bulb near the pantry, reported suddenly feeling hands pushing her at the back as if to shove her from the stool. Turning to see would do such an awful thing, she saw that she was all alone. Now, there are many, many, many more tales from the staff at Croxteth Hall. It seems that most of the workforce has had some type of strange experience in the building one person who the lady who conducted the survey 
Fiona has said there is never anything you might think that is malevolent. So it's just like somebody is living there. The events are not that regular. You hear noises and things, but assume they are natural settling of old houses. Just every now and again, you see something which you just can't explain. Now, John, who wrote this uh, amazing book, 800 Years of Liverpool Haunted Liverpool, has personally like to thank Fiona and Neil, who is the event manager, and all of the staff for the help in this story. Um, and again, I'd like to thank him for letting me relay this story to all of you guys. And please, if you um, are interested in these stories, then please go and buy his book. Uh, it's in Amazon. It's not very expensive. And it's, it's a good book. I really suggest you. Um, it's a good read. Anyway, enough of me rambling on today. I hope you enjoyed today's long story about Croxteth Park. It's a lovely place. And hopefully you will see a tour of it soon upon the channel. For now, take care and I will see you all in the next video. Peace.